Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to the first Jolly O'Curie programme webinar of 2020. And this time we're going to be talking about a very important topic for your career progression and that's how to present your research. It's a fascinating topic. It's something that does give people uh, worries and concerns, I know. But um, just to introduce who we've got on the panel today, we're very lucky to have um, Dr. Petra Cameron, who's a senior lecturer in chemistry at the University of Bath, and Dr. Daniela Gasparini, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bath. My name's Julie Franklin. I'm a career and professional development advisor at the Royal Society of Chemistry, and I run the Jolly O'Curie program, of which which I will say a little bit more in a minute or two. But I wonder if our speakers would just like to say hello. Petra, would you say, would like to say hello to everyone listening? Yes, hello. Hi, I'm Petra. Um, as Julie said, I'm a lecturer at the University of Bath. Um, I work in materials, um, energy materials and solar cells mainly. And I've given lots and lots of talks, seminars, lectures, um, outreach talks over the years. So. Uh, hopefully can kind of pass on some of my tips that I've learned doing <laughs> that over the years. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Daniela, would you like to say hello? Hi, yes, uh, I'm Daniela. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bath and uh, I work in the field of uh, chemical catalysis, organometallic chemistry, and uh, as well, I've always enjoyed joining conferences, seminars to talk about chemistry, learn, exchange, exchange knowledge, but mainly to network and meet peers from the world. And I've actively participated to uh, conferences, national and international conferences, and giving presentation and shown posters about my research. OK, thank you both very much. So there's uh, there's not much about presenting that you haven't experienced or or can't pass on your wisdom to our audience. So that's fantastic news. Before we get started, I would just like to explain a little bit about the Jolly O'Curie programme for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Jolly O'Curie programme is something that the Royal Society of Chemistry is very proud to organise and host. Um, it's particularly for postdoctoral researchers who are aiming for uh, an independent career in academic research. And its particular focus is to support diversity and inclusion in academia. Uh, we do many different things. Obviously, this year, doing things like conferences and meetings is a little bit out of it. But normally, you know, do keep an eye on what's happening. Jolly O'Curie wise, we do have events, webinars and more things to support postdoctoral researchers because we realise that um, there's not an awful lot of specific support out there for you and obviously we want to try and uh, help help you as much as we possibly can. The Jolly O'Curie programme itself is named for Irene Jolly O'Curie who was a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry in 1935 and um, she, she was actually the daughter of uh, Marie Curie who, who we all have all heard of. Um, Irene, actually, her work on radioisotopes forms the basis of most biomedical research today. And um, you can find out more about her. Uh, we ran a project called the 175 Faces of Chemistry a few years back now. And on the screen now, you'll see a link. Irene was one of our 175 faces. So if you're interested, you can find out more about her there. Um, this year, as I said, we can't hold conferences and meetings, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 situation, but we have got a series of webinars. The first one today is on presenting your research. The second one in October is um, sort of be careful what you wish for. You know, what happens when you get your first academic position? It might not necessarily be what you anticipated. So we've got to speak. We've got some speakers to help us with that. And then the third um the third in the series for this year is all about the, the dreadful subject of bullying, which we shouldn't have to talk about, I know, but nonetheless we do. And it's all about protecting yourself and how to support your colleagues too. So if you're interested in any of those, they're all free. You know, they're all on our events pages. So do feel free to sign up for as many as you want. And I would say as well that don't worry about taking too many notes today, because what we do is we record all these webinars and we put them up on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to find it there and listen again um, at another time, should you wish. So I hope that's helpful for you to understand where we're all coming from today. Um, just to go through the agenda. 
what we're going to cover. We're going to be on air for about an hour and we're going to talk about why presentation skills are important in academic research. I'm going to go through some hints and tips for giving a good presentation, what to do and what not to do, the all important subject of preparation. Um, what you can actually do to control your nerves, because, you know, most people are a little bit anxious, we must admit. How to use PowerPoint effectively and other props that you can use. How to handle questions from your audience. And also uh, finishing up with support that you can get from the RSC, particularly if you are a member of the RSC. So I hope that's, uh, that's what you were expecting. And I think, first of all, we need to look at why presentation skills are important. So why is it important to do that? I'm going to go to Petra first and say, Petra, you've participated in panels where important decisions are made about a researcher's future. So can you tell us from your perspective why presenting is an essential skill for postdocs? I think presenting your research effectively and with enthusiasm is, is incredibly important throughout your academic career. Um, I've sat on quite a few interview panels, so interviews for postdoc positions, interviews for lectureship, new lectureship positions, and also in, um, interviews for fellowship positions. And on all of those panels, the candidates had to give a research talk. Now, what we always say is you can't lose the position by giving, um, sorry, I'm going around, you're not going to get the position. If you give a brilliant talk, um, but everything else is terrible. It's not that that will get you the position, but you can lose a position based on a bad talk. So you can have lots of good things in your CV, but if you give a bad research talk, it's a reason to basically then not be given the position. So being able to really give a good talk is something that stands you in incredibly good stead for when you are applying for academic positions. It's really important. That's a really good point, actually, isn't it? You know, it is how you can lose something that you really want. So, yes, I mean, we don't want to frighten people, but keep that in mind. You know, we are going to go through some practical things that will help you um, to, to, to give the best possible presentation that you have, um, that you can. Yeah. Sorry, Gina, I was just going to say I've actually been on interview panels where some of the front running candidates have lost the position because the talk that they gave just wasn't considered good enough. So, so this is a real thing that does happen. Oh my word! Okay, right. Well, let's let's, let's hold <laughs> that thought and let's go into some positive stuff about uh, what we can do about it. It's obviously it's vital to get it right. And the other thing to realise that, of course, it's one thing to be an excellent researcher and get the science done, which I'm sure you all are. But it's quite another thing to present that research to an audience, either when you're giving a talk or a presentation or, or presenting a poster, even. And even the most competent researcher can be very anxious about it, and understandably so. Um, it's obvious to say that the skill set that you need to do research isn't necessarily the same as the skill set that you need to give a good, engaging, inspiring presentation that's going to create that rapport with the audience and make you memorable for all the right reasons. Um, I think, you know, all of us who've presented, we've all experienced that feeling of dread or even panic sometimes at the thought of standing up in front of an audience. You know, there's a dry mouth, the shaking hands, the hesitant del delivery. Uh, does that all sound familiar to you, Petra? Oh, yes, definitely. I still get nervous before talks now. I get less nervous than I did when I was a student or a postdoc. I can remember being incredibly nervous. I really remember my first ever PhD talk. Um, it was a small conference, a very friendly conference, but I, I remember standing up and seeing the screen behind me, which was about four metres high and three metres across. It was enormous. And I was standing up in front of a room of people and I just froze completely. I didn't know what to say. I completely forgot what was on my first slide and it was awful. Um, but luckily I had practised the talk so many times that after about 30 seconds of just standing there frozen, um, my automatic reflexes kicked in and I just started talking and it, it got a lot better from then on in and, and it, it was fine. The talk was absolutely fine, but it was very, very scary at the time. And I think the most stressful talk that I've given um, was my first independent talk. So, so when you're a PhD student and, and, and sometimes also when you're a postdoc, you still have a supervisor who's looking at your slides, who's helping you with feedback and who's really going through the talk with you very often. And my first independent talk was the first talk I'd given that nobody else had looked at the slides. I had done the work, it was my idea, um, I had put the talk together, 
and it was really the first time that I was standing up and saying, this is my research, this is what I'm doing. And I was so nervous. It was terrible, <laughs> but it went OK in the end. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure the presentation wasn't terrible, but how you felt may have been terrible. And yeah, how sure I felt that's... was terrible. I think the presentation went quite well in the end, but I, I did feel very nervous. Well, there's a lesson in that even that sometimes, you know, you can be feeling dreadful, but still, you know, with the right kind of it's interesting what you said about the preparation actually helped you. And we're going to come back to um, preparation a little bit later in the talk. Um, Danila, can I ask how you felt initially about giving presentations about your research? Oh yes, I, I felt like really nervous and I still feel nervous now and I feared so many things. I feared of rambling, I feared of talking too fast, I feared of losing my train of thoughts and um, and as well, I fear that just in front of my audience, I wouldn't have been able to deliver my research aims and my results clearly. And uh, and also, um, I, I feared of uh, being boring and of losing attention because obviously we all know that nobody really likes uh, boring talk so yeah <laughs> thank you i think that's true to say you know we've all seen presentations that have inspired us but also probably had to sit through talks that made us wish we were somewhere else um, and I think it's important to realise that in both of those cases, it's probably not the subject matter that grabbed or didn't grab you, but the way it was delivered. Um, and I think it's also important to realise that presentation skills are not innate. We all have to learn them. Some people are quicker to do it than others, but nobody is born a brilliant presenter. I think it's fair to say it's, it's a learned behaviour that we can all get better at. And I also think it's important to understand that you don't have to be anyone other than yourself. And showing your natural passion for the work you do is key to getting the audience fired up. So you don't have to be overly formal or corporate, but you do need to be well prepared and rehearsed. So we're going to start talking about some advice now on how to prepare for presentations and formats. So can I come to you first, Danila? I'm going to put a few points up on the screen while you're talking about how to prepare for a presentation. Presentation. Uh, so I think the first question that you have to ask yourself is actually what is the goal of your presentation and what do you want to communicate to your audience? And uh, yeah, yeah I, can, uh, <laughs> I was going to say I completely agree with that, Danila. Sorry, we've got a bit of a delay on the line, don't we? Um, I totally agree. I think it's so important that your talk has a narrative because you, you need to get across why are you doing this work? What are the challenges? And most importantly, why is it exciting? Um, you know, you really want to be able to communicate to someone else why they should care about what you're doing. And I think it's also important to remember you don't need to show all your results. You might just show selected highlights. Um, but but what's really important is, is that story, that that kind of the setting for your research. And, and I mark now every year dozens of undergraduate student talks. So our final year project students give talks at the end of every year. And the best talks are the ones where they really put their research into context. And the worst talks are the ones where, and we've all sat in talks like this, someone just launches straight into their research findings without saying why they're doing it, or why it's so important that they do do this research. So, yeah, I think like the. Sorry, <laughs> is that delay? I no, think I it's important to, to be passionate to about about. Yeah. Can we come to as the you say, it's there? like yeah. you need to you need to. Uh, sorry. Um. I was going to say, yeah, uh, linking to what Petra said, is that you need to show how passionate you are about your research and why is it important. And surely your audience will be uh, passionate about it too. And I think it's important, um, as you, Julie, uh, shows and showing the slides, to not be afraid to leave open points of discussion because. Um, it's important to have some open questions that can tickle the curiosity of your audience. I agree with that as well. So some of the best talks I've seen, um, the talk has outlined a scientific problem. It has shown the data and suggested the theories that best matches 
matched the data and then opened a discussion so actually had a discussion with the talk audience about what it might mean so given some suggestions and then really discussed you know what is the meaning of these results um and, and it's so important to remember that you can give a fantastic talk without necessarily knowing all the answers or being able to interpret everything you're really just showing your data honestly and discussing it very often and yes finally you don't need to be afraid as well of cutting down your work because sometimes uh, for example four years of phd cannot definitely fit in in that 20 minute presentation and i guess as well like a career uh years years of uh, uh career cannot fit in a 20 minute presentation yeah yeah i really agree danila so don't cram too much in so take your time space out um your points and i normally find so when i'm giving a talk i normally count on one minute per slide so if it's a 15 20 minute talk i will almost certainly have no more than 15 slides including my title and my acknowledgements and i find that that's about right now it does it does change um the more talks you give the slower you get and the fewer slides you need i think that that's definitely true but it's, it's definitely worth timing yourself and having roughly the right number of slides but just really not too many yeah it's important to not overrun because it's it's definitely not respectful to others and you will lose attention too so prepare yourself ahead and know your time limits and as well it's really important to define a clear format and the structure and to structure your slide appropriately and uh, it's important to avoid busy and distracted slides where that's, there is too too much and too many information and don't add too much text and try to express your concept with impactful images and graphs instead yeah i agree completely um Another really important point actually for me is something that's kind of interesting because Danila and I think have to deal with this in different ways. And that's thinking about the language that you use when you're giving a presentation. So my first language is English and I'm lucky that most scientific presentations are in English, but at international conferences um, or just generally, the thing you have to remember is that most of your audience won't have English as a first language. And I think as a native English speaker, it's far too easy to think I don't have to worry about what language I use because I already speak English and it's, it's really not true. Um, one of the worst talks I've ever been to was a native English speaker who spoke incredibly quickly, used lots of idiomatic language and language that was familiar maybe to, to people from, from his area, but not um familiar to the wider audience and he really lost the audience very very quickly so i think it's so important to think about the audience think about your pace and the language you use and think about being as clear to as many people as possible and i'm incredibly lucky as i said i give i give scientific i give scientific talks in my first language um, I have a colleague who impresses me so much because she gives scientific talks in her third language but she gives amazingly good scientific talks. I mean, very clear, very precise, really good slides in her third language. And I think the reason her talks are so good is because she really thinks about what she wants to say and how she's going to structure her slides and how to get her points across um, in her third language. So Danila, I don't know if you want to comment on that as well. Yes, I totally agree with you, Petra. And being a non-native English speaker, I've always had to prepare my presentation really well. And I need to double check my slides for spelling mistakes and typos multiple times. And um, it's true, I try every day to expand on my vocabulary and to memorize new words. And I would love to be fluent in English. So to be able to you know, construct a, a nice flower speech, However, when I present, I still prefer to use uh, familiar terms because it makes me more comfortable. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't overthink about my own words when describing my research. And uh, also, yeah, that's something that I've always been told 
if you can't explain your research in simple terms, so you probably don't know enough about it. And uh, when, when it comes to attending international conferences, what I've realized is that non-native speaker seminars can be really, really good, but you, you definitely realize that the speaker has visibly practiced. But if the speaker hasn't practiced, uh, sometimes it can be really hard to follow. And in fact, I realized that it is not just a matter of language and pronunciation, but most of the time it is just about preparing yourself well to give a talk. And that's why like, it's really important to rehearse and try your presentation beforehand. I couldn't agree more as Julie here again. I think you've made some excellent points there, both of you. But the rehearsal thing is absolutely essentially important. Um, I would say make sure you've actually run through the presentation in all its glory with a friend or a colleague as a sounding board before you do it in front of the audience. And talking of which, make sure you've researched who that audience is going to be too. You know, who are they? How many of them will there be? And what's their level of knowledge on the subject? You will need to adapt your approach, approach accordingly. So try and find out about the venue in advance as well if you'll be off your home territory. What facilities are you going to have at your disposal? Will there be someone available to help you with setting up the IT in case of technical problems? That's always my biggest worry, I must admit. Is it going to be a lecture theatre or something less formal? You know, all of these things are so important in terms of the language you're going to use, the props you're going to use, all the things that you're going to do to really draw your audience in. These are all the things that you need to, to, to find out in advance if you, if you possibly can. And I mean, in terms of rehearsing and practicing, your research group could agree to be a testing ground for each other. You could try out on each other um, when you're in a friendly situation with people that you know, because I think it's important to hear yourself saying those words before you actually do it in front of an audience, you know, so that your, your brain is used to hearing you saying those things. And find opportunities to give presentations in a less scary context um, if you're very nervous. So things like outreach work with schools or local community groups will help. And it doesn't matter whether it's chemistry related or not, um, because as we've said before, it's a different skill set that you're developing. Um, so we're going to talk about rehearsal tips now and things to avoid. And um, Petra, can, can, can you help us here? I think one of the things, especially in the early days when you're giving talks, is, is you have a tendency to try and learn everything you want to say by heart. And sometimes that's a mistake because it just comes across as if, you know, you're parroting something or you're just reading things off the slides. Um, so you want to, you don't want to sound as if you're just reading text. You want to discuss your slides and expand on what you show on the slides. Um, so expand on your graphs or your images, explain what they mean, explain what the data says and why it's important. Um, but that's not to say you shouldn't practice the talk out loud many times. Um, so the more you practice it, the more confident you will get, the more sure you are about what you want to say. Um, so these days I don't always have time and I, I don't always practice talks out loud beforehand, but in the early days I, I always did. Um, but even now, I still go through every single slide. I think about what points I want to make on each slide and how I want to get the information across. And I always do that before every presentation. Yeah, I, I think it's important to try your presentation with like friends uh, in a familiar uh, context and ask for feedback. And the research group you're working in or your research group can help too. I remember Andy, my PhD supervisor, and he really knew it well. And the last year PhD seminar is a big deal for final doctorate student in San Andreas, at San Andreas University. And uh, he made me go through my presentation twice in front of the group and double check my presentation himself. And it was, it really helped because after these mock talks, I was ready to go out there and present my research to the whole chemistry department. But also, um, as Petra said, you shouldn't learn your presentation by heart. What you can do instead is write down some keywords that will help you on remembering and following your logical uh, flow and the logical flow of your story. That will definitely help. 
Yeah, that's very good advice. Thank you very much. And I think it was important what Petra said right at the very beginning when she said she froze and didn't know what to say. But then she had rehearsed so much that eventually she found the words to get going. And once she got going, you know, she felt far more confident then. So um, obviously you can do all sorts of things to bring your presentation to, to life. So let's talk a little bit about um, visual aids and props and other ways to increase the impact of your presentation. Um, you know, the perennial question to PowerPoint or not to PowerPoint. What's your view, Petra? Oh, um, these days at conferences and seminars, PowerPoint is really the default software that everybody is using in chemistry. Um, when I started out, there were still some older professors using overhead projectors and had these wonderful overhead projector slides where they were flipping bits of acetate in and out as they were giving their talks. But really now that that's not seen and pretty much everyone is using PowerPoint or equivalent to PowerPoint. Um, I was chatting with Danila about this last week and she mentioned, and I have to see if I can pronounce it right because it's not software I've ever used before, but Prezi, is that right Danila? Yes, Prezi? Prezi. Yeah. Prezi. Um, Although when we were discussing it, we were saying so so looking at it, it's it's not very chemistry user friendly because it can be really quite hard to put, you know, chem draw or um chemical structures into that software. So it's not always very user friendly. But I think you just have to find one that works for you um and, and go with it. But 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 having slides, overhead um overhead slides is really the standard. Yeah, I've tried to use Prezi myself, and uh, it's a really nice interface. It's a beautiful program, but as you said, I don't really think it's uh, chemistry user friendly, and I really found it hard to uh, present my, you know, my molecules, and so I prefer to use PowerPoint, which is the easiest one for me, probably because I'm used to it, and uh, I think it's important to couple to PowerPoint or to your uh, your favorite program, it's important to choose uh, the right uh, uh, program to make some good images as well. And there are many programs out there. And personally, I draw my molecules with ChemDraw, but to make higher resolution images, it's better to use Adobe Illustrator, but also BioRender that's more biologically um, oriented or Blender. And uh, it's important as well to have some proper graphs. The easiest uh, programs to use are definitely Excel and MATLAB. But I heard of people using GraphPad, Origin, Vector, but there are many others out there. And I think the, the most important thing is to uh, learn how to use uh, a couple of programs and be really confident with it and explore the functionalities of these programs and so with, with uh, you will definitely reach the best results with it. Okay thank you and uh, do either of you um, ever use any other props? How about you Petra? Yes I have quite quite often so, so when I'm lecturing the undergraduates I quite often give little demonstrations and try and highlight what I'm saying um, with some small demonstrations. Um, and also, particularly if I'm giving an outreach talk, so if I'm talking to the general public or to school children, I will always have some samples to pass around. I might have one or two kind of very short kitchen demonstrations. So normally nothing dangerous, nothing with real chemicals, but kitchen type demonstrations that can actually illustrate the points I'm trying to make. Um, and I find demonstrations can be a really good way or it can be a really good way of breaking up a talk. So especially if you're doing a longer kind of outreach talk, um, it's a good way of keeping people's attention. So it gives the audience a break from listening to you talking with your slides and you actually engage them then in looking at something, maybe discussing what do they think is going to happen or you know, discussing um, the results of the demonstration, if you like. And I've done that both at kind of science cafe type talks. Um, I think one of the, the scariest talks I've ever done was a, a short presentation to a room full of four year olds. So there was 34 year olds. It was part of a science week event um, in their classroom. And I, I was asked to give a talk about the science of bubbles, which is a really nice thing to talk about with 44 year olds. And I have to say, I think it's the most enthusiastic seminar audience I have ever had. They were absolutely fantastic. Um, so 
that was a talk which was very much tailored to the audience, which we were talking about earlier. So it had literally three PowerPoint slides with pictures on. There was nothing else. Um, a, a very short video and three PowerPoint slides. And then the rest of, of the, the session was really them getting hands on and looking at bubbles, learning about bubbles. Um, and it, it was fantastic. Um, and I really recommend. So if you can get involved in outreach talks, um, it's a really good way to build your confidence and to learn how to talk about general science, you know, effectively and enthusiastically. So I really recommend giving these type of talks. Yes, I, I personally never used a prop. Oops, but um, I remember a postdoc colleague of mine and she used uh, uh, rocks uh, to talk about her research on fluorescent materials. So she was uh, studying uh, aluminosilicate minerals, uh, and so she used this uh, rock, which looked re pretty dull at first sight, but she started shining uh, UV lights on the on the rock, and they became fluorescent. The rock became fluorescent, and this image will remain impressed in my memory and definitely prove the points on using props to communicate your message. And, uh, and also, she was a postdoctoral researcher, so it's never too early to, you know, get creative and, and start uh, using those kind of uh, uh, aid. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's right what you say, you know, the right, a well-timed prop or an appropriate prop like that or demonstration can really, um, you know, cement your talk in the minds of the people who, who are your audience. Um, because, of course, it, it can be helpful for all of you to bear in, in mind that within your audience, there will be a variety of learning styles. Um, we know that some people take things in best by what they hear, um, others by what they see and some by what they do so I think a well chosen if you've got the if you've got the capacity to do it a well chosen variety of visual aids props and demonstrations and so on can really help you to make that connection with your audience um, but you know I would say don't overdo it any aid or prop should enhance your message and illustrate it rather than detracting from it um, so that, there's some great tips there and yes, do use the right kind of props, but we're going to tackle the tricky subject of feeling nervous now. Um, I think it's fair to say that most people will be a little bit nervous and that's to be expected. Your audience will probably be expecting that. You're not a professional um, presenter after all. It's not like you've just come from your TV show or something like that. So, um, you know, don't worry too much. But um, think about yourself before you do your talk. Think about yourself and how you behave when you are nervous and make sure that you've arranged simple things like having some water to hand um, in case you get the dreaded dry mouth. You know, sipping some water can give you a momentary respite from presenting and allow you to gather your thoughts and allow your audience to catch up with you, too. If you know that you're the kind of person whose voice speeds up or goes squeaky when you're nervous, then practice as much as you can beforehand. Rehearse in front of a mirror, you know, stand up tall, look straight ahead and smile. That's how you're looking when you're confident. So get used in your own body to know how that feels. And then you can do that when you're in front of your audience. So um, any other tips for controlling nerves, Petra? Um, I usually stick to deep breathing exercises. I find they help me um, before a talk if I'm getting really nervous. I have friends who've had really good results with recording themselves. So they've actually kind of, you know, asked someone to record their talk and then watched it back. Now, I personally would find that horrendous. I don't think I'd want to watch <laughs> my talk too. back in gory detail. But yeah. Some people really get get a lot out of that and really by watching it back, they realise where they've gone wrong and they can really improve their presentation. Um, another thing which I, I was thinking about, actually, which is if you know that you fidget a lot. So, that, you know, sometimes when you're in the audience and you see someone who's giving a talk, who's clearly very nervous and, and they're fidgeting. And someone that something that someone told me helped them was that they just held something in their hands. So held a pencil or held something in their hands and it just helped to kind of anchor them a little bit and stop them from from fidgeting around too much. Um, but I still get really nervous every time I talk pretty much. I mean, it really does depend on the audience, what I'm talking about. 
um, undergraduate lectures. I still get nervous giving undergraduate lectures because that that can be a very tough audience and trying to, you know, I really feel like I've achieved something if I can communicate how enthusiastic I am, if I can communicate, you know, um, all of the basic science to, to my undergraduate audience. And, and that kind of, in a way, now for me, puts my research talks into perspective. Um, and I find them a lot less nerve wracking than I did 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, I, I am still working on it right now. Like, um, I, I, for example, I try to focus on a couple of audience members who look interested in what I'm saying. And that makes me at ease and definitely I feel more confident. And also, I think that this is, this is important. I like to keep eye contact because it also helps me to face the audience instead of turning my back to the audience and start reading my slides and uh, yeah I like also uh, that's really important to me um, for me it's uh, thinking about something funny or something uh, nice before uh, going out there and presenting uh, my research because it puts me in a good mood and I feel more positive and so yeah yeah, that's, that's so good. That's great. Can I yeah, like, yes, of course. Sorry that I just thought of that. I, that I think Daniela's point of making eye contact is really important. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can only make eye contact with your audience if you've practiced enough to know what you're talking about. Because if you're not sure what's coming up on the next slide or what you actually really want to say about the next slide, um, you know, you're going to be turning around all the time trying to remember what's up there. Oh, yes, now this is coming. So if you've practiced enough and you're, com you're then confident about what you're going to say, you can really almost not think too much about the slides anymore and really face your audience and present to them. Yeah, that's that's a very good and point. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Thank you, Petra. Um, so we're going to move on now. Uh, we've talked about um, how to control your nerves, how to make sure the audience is interested. But there is a structure to a presentation. I mean, I, I remember once being told, and this is a message that stayed with me for all of my life in all the presentations that I've done, is when you're preparing your presentation, what you need to think about is you're going to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. You know, you can't go far wrong with that. That has stood me in good stead. I've never been booed off stage yet. And I think that's really important. Um, you can tell from that funny little thing to say that summarising is actually one of the most vital parts of winding up a presentation and leaving that lasting positive impression. So summarising, you know, don't skip on that. It's really important. Um, what, what advice do, do, do our guests today have on summing up effectively? Yes, I think summarizing is important. I, and personally, I try to use a cyclical narrative that makes a story end where it began. But instead of thinking it as a um, in, in literary terms, I see it more like a really a catalytic cycle. And uh, so if your system needs to continue to be efficient and continue to work well, you must go back to the initial point and reform your catalyst. So what does it mean and, and for like conclusions uh, is that your conclusions need to describe how your research efforts brought you closer to your initial aims. So, for example, if you have highlighted in your intro how important it is to synthesize a specific molecules or a mimic of it, and what are the reasons to synthesizing it? In your conclusion, you need to state how close you are to this goal. So have you actually reached uh, uh, how close you are to your, uh, uh, to your goal? And also, I think it's important uh, to say that the conclusions are um, an, a moment where you can actually suggest how much more you can do and how much more the research community can do to improve on that specific topic. I, I think that's really a nice analogy, actually. I love the catalytic cycle analogy, I have to say. Um, but I think, you know, be succinct, give your key findings and absolutely relate them to the goals of your project. Even if your findings show that your goals were not sensible in the first place, which can often happen in science, you know, go back and say that. Um, but absolutely. So just give your key findings and don't be afraid to spend, five, you know, a couple of minutes just going through them. 
Yeah, that's yeah. really good advice. You want to leave people with that thought, don't you? So, uh, yeah, no, that's fantastic advice. Thank you both. Um, another potential minefield towards the end of the presentation is usually you, you're expected to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> now, you have no control over what people are going to ask. So how do you deal with questions and possibly ones that you have no answer for? Oh dear, yeah, there's always those dreaded questions that you don't know how to answer. I mean, I think the first thing is, don't be afraid to ask for the question to be repeated. If it wasn't clear the first time, please just say, you know, could you possibly just repeat the question? Or could you clarify the question if, if you weren't entirely sure what you were being asked? So never be afraid to ask that. Um, very often questions are just things that have been missed. So someone has seen your talk, but they've missed some point and they just would like to have it clarified. So the majority of questions are just clarifications. Um, sometimes people will disagree with your findings. So sometimes you will have a question um, from someone who has a different theory or a different idea about the results. And you have to be willing and ready to kind of defend your own ideas with your data but also maybe to admit when you're wrong, um, that, that can happen as well. Sometimes you can get your best new ideas from talking at conferences and discussing your scientific results. Um, sometimes there will be questions that you genuinely don't know the answer to. And I really don't think there's any shame in saying, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think that's completely fine. I think you shouldn't be frightened of saying that. Um, you can also go with, with you know, um, common answers that you will hear in many conferences. Oh, that's a very interesting point. I haven't <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> or, you know, what an interesting question. Let's discuss it further in the coffee break. So, you know, th there's always those type of answers that you will hear as well. But I personally don't have any problem with being honest. If I don't know the answer to something, I'll say, well, I don't actually know the answer to that, it, you know, and then try and draw in some more conversation about what, what the answer might be. Uh, yeah, that's really good advice, Petra. I mean, I, you know, it's far better to admit that you don't know the answer, I would think, than, you know, trying to make something up on the spot and really destroying the really good talk you might have given before by saying something that's, you know, sort of um, it has been thought up on the hop and doesn't really make any sense or, you know, just detracts from the, the impact that you've already made. So, no, I'm, I would agree with you. There's there's really no shame in, in saying you don't know the answer if you don't. That, that's absolutely fine. So it's going to be our turn to ask for questions from, from the audience now. Um, I'm going to ask um, one last question to our panel guests now. And while they answer, um, if you're logged in, uh, please feel free to type in any questions that you might have. And, and I will put them to our panelists afterwards. We may not get time to go through them all, but do feel free now while you're listening to these answers to type in your own questions and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what's, uh, what's bothering you. So here's the last question to the panelists then. If you had one piece of advice then to offer an aspiring presenter or an anxious presenter, what would it be? Can we ask Petra first? Yeah, so my advice is really just find a friendly audience and practice and practice as many times as you need to, to build your confidence. And that friendly audience can be your research peers, it might be your research group, your supervisor, but really find that audience, practice and ask for feedback and don't be afraid to change your slides, you know, listen to that feedback and incorporate it into your presentation. Um, and, and that will really help you improve your presentation skills and become more confident as a presenter. Yes, I think it's important to find a friendly audience, as Petra said. And I think it's important to engage in networking opportunity as well. And so participate to conferences, symposium events. All of these events can give you an opportunity really to present to an audience and to also develop confidence. In Bath, we organized a, a seminar where actually postdocs uh, could uh, present their research and it was a, a really great opportunity for uh, the postdoc, mm, uh, postdoctoral researcher to show their research and to actually yeah, develop confidence because they're in a more familiar environment. And so it's important also to organize events where you and your peer can practice. And so best of all, really get involved and uh, get out there. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. And, and I would say that that is where I met Danila and Petra. I was actually invited to go to this event for postdocs that Danila had organised. She did a brilliant job of it, I have to say. And obviously it's led on to other, other opportunities for her and for Petra to join in with this webinar, for example, and do other things which are going to you know, help to develop that all important skill set. Now, we have got some questions coming in. So I'm going to start with question number one. Someone saying hello. That's very, very nice of you. Hello to you too. Here's a question for both presenters, please. Do you use CAR stories? And CAR is challenge action results when you create the narrative. So would anyone like to, to tackle that one? Goodness, uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I really think about it in those terms, but I, I suspect I probably do, yes, because I'm always thinking about, you know, what was the scientific problem, um, how have I addressed it, and what results do I have? Um, so yes, I, I think probably, but but not specifically in those terms. Okay, did I, I to add? Oh, sorry, yes, I, I think, yeah, I think the word challenge and the way I tackle, I tackle my research is actually, yeah, potentially those are the good terms for me because I really feel it as a challenge and something that I need to try and solve and try to get closer to. So, yes, I would say, yes, I feel it this way in those terms. Yeah, you maybe do it without realising that's what you're doing. I mean, it's it's handy sometimes to have an acronym like CAR, isn't it? Because it does help you to it does help you to prepare. So yeah, anything like that, you know, or STAR, situation, task, action, result, you know, all of those sorts of things. If if you like a mnemonic like that, it can help you, and it can also help you to when you're presenting because you can have that mnemonic in your head and and just um, you know go according to to, to the order of of the letters in in your in the Monic. So thank you very much for that one. Here's another one. Um, hi, how can we make the PowerPoint more attractive with animations? Is there any software available for that? Who'd like to take? Oh, you see, this is an interesting question. Sorry, Julia, I thought you'd finished there. Um, this no. is a really interesting question. I, I get nervous about too many animations in PowerPoint. So I'm a great believer in slightly more minimalist slides. Um, with, with nice graphs, nice data presentation, nice figures. And I actually these days try to minimise the amount of animation to a bare minimum, um, because I think sometimes your slides just get too busy. There's too much going on. People are too busy looking at your animation, so they're not listening to what you're actually saying. Now, the exceptions to that are where you do animations um, you know, so for example, if I'm talking about a solar cell, it can be quite nice to have an animation showing where the electrons and the holes are going and showing how the solar cell works. But I think that would be the only ex um, exception I would I would use. So so really, I try not to use animation. So I'm probably not the right person to tell you what software I would use for them. Delina, any advice from you? I don't know, like, I, I never used it myself, but I've uh, seen loads of uh, uh, presentation where um, the, 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 the speaker was actually using, uh, was presenting actually crystal structures that were actually rotating and uh, it, it could actually show the crystals, uh, the structure from different perspective and I really liked it. And I believe that for this specific um, uh, kind of images and animation you can potentially just use softwares like uh, Olex or Mercury they are generally like a uh, software used uh, in uh, uh, crystallography and crystal solving so uh, and I, I guess yeah animations probably as Petra said are the kind of animation unless they uh, yeah they they get to the point on what you're trying to say probably it's best to avoid to you know um yeah add too many too many things and too many information that can distract the the, the audience yes 
Yes, I quite agree with you. You know, I think what should stand out from your talk is the points that you're trying to make rather than the fact that you're a wizard at, um, you know, doing strange animations on the screen, which will distract. I think one of the worst presentations I ever saw was someone who was using bullet points appearing on their slides and each bullet came in as like a racing car with a screech of tyres. <laughs> it was absolutely oh. awful. I can't remember anything about the subject of that presentation. Just this awful you know, really embarrassing uh, use of, of, of animations, which I thought were completely inappropriate. I mean, that's an extreme example, but it just does illustrate yeah. me that, you know, um, maybe sometimes less is more. But, you know, when you are talking about, so you are going to have to use some animations if you're trying to show sort of 3D molecules rotating and that kind of thing. But, you know, that's fair enough. But as for other animations, I think I would agree with you that less is more. OK, we've got a really interesting one now. Here's a gritty one to get our teeth into. Um, how do you deal with someone that's argumentative and insists that you have not done something right? <laughs> Who'd like to um, that? <laughs> I had this quite recently at a conference um, with a piece of work that I was presenting, which we, we have developed a model for. And models are always contentious because, the, you know, the data is not contentious. The data is just as it is. But if you're interpreting that data with a model and someone else has a different model from you, um, that, that can be quite contentious. So, so I, I gave my talk and I had some really interesting questions. Um, and then one of the members of the audience happened to be someone who believes that a different model should be used. Um, but it was actually rather difficult because where someone believes that a different model should be used and discusses it with you, that's fine. You know, there's no reason why you can't have a really good discussion about, well, I use this parameter because, you know, of this reason. Um, oh, actually, I think you should use a slightly different parameter. That's fine. Where you have a problem is where someone just says, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and won't discuss it with you. And, and that can be really, really difficult. And, and sometimes all you can do is they're not going to actually have a scientific discussion and they're not going to say, you know, this is the scientific reason why I think this is wrong. And then you can actually, you know, either come back or say, oh, that might be a good point. Actually, I hadn't thought of that. Um, if they just say, no, you're wrong and won't discuss it with you, all you can do is try and bring it to a close because they're not going to change their mind or engage with you. So I think all you can do is just say, well, you know, let's agree to disagree or let's let's discuss this in more detail afterwards. I think that's all you can do there. Yes, I think you're probably right. We've got quite a, I'm going to race on to the next question now. We've got quite a few coming in. Um, the next person is asking, um, can we talk about chemistry tools and web links for preparing presentations? Um, what are your favourite ones for that? If, it, if it's a, a chemistry thing, I guess, you know, a molecule or something that you're, that you're trying to, to present. So I'm a physical uh, chemist, so I should probably pass to Danila on this because I use Origin for pretty much everything. <laughs> so. Okay, Danila, any any advice from you? Yes, I mean, like as I said, I think the program that I use the most is potentially yeah, Chem ChemDraw uh, to to draw molecules. It's the program that is actually I think it's the 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 best uh, or the one that I've always learned how to use. Uh, I, uh, I know that like other pro programs uh, and for example BioRend uh, that has become really like uh, used in the biology and biochemistry community but I've tried to use it a couple of times and I really found, hard, found it hard, find it hard to uh, draw my molecules uh, and to make them yeah you, you know look, look, make a scheme or a, um, a reaction arrow or reaction mechanism look need mm -hmm. so i personally still use uh, chemical and once once you learn how to use it and once you learn how to you know um highlight uh, with the right colors uh, and uh, to um, to have everything like in the best and the neat uh, um uh, to present everything in a neat way in a clear way i think it's uh, it's good enough 
Okay, we have a couple more questions. Someone is just asking why why they can't see us, why we can't make eye contact with them. What I would say is that is that when we use video, it's just another thing that can go wrong, I'm afraid. Um, we, we keep the video off because our audience also ha are, are all over the world and they have different um, internet connections. And we just find, um, I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see us and I'm sorry that we can't see you, but we just find that, you know, it, it's what, it's an extra level of complication that can make things go wrong. Right. OK, now here's an interesting one. Have you ever had to deal with data being confidential and how would you approach this situation? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm. Um, personally, I haven't or I've never had to talk about my confidential data. I've always managed to talk about something else. Um, but this is something we often come across. So for I said earlier that I mark placement talks. So um, most of our third year undergraduates go on a, a placement to a company and when they come back they have to give a research talk and I would say at least 60% of those talks they can't talk about any of the data um, because all that data is is covered by some kind of confidentiality agreement with the company and it's incredibly difficult it really is incredibly difficult to give a good talk where you can't mention any of the data and what normally happens is the talks end up being quite superficial. So you, you, you talk about, you know, parallel examples from the literature or um, you kind of talk in general terms about what you're doing. But it's, it's, it's very, very hard to do well. Um, I, I've seen one or two examples where people have done it well. And again, because they've maybe had two parts of their research, one that was confidential one that was slightly different that wasn't confidential and they were able to kind of talk about it you know talk about those parts of the research that weren't confidential and then allude to the bits that were confidential and um, but without giving too much detail away but i will say it's incredibly difficult to give a really good scientific presentation where you can't talk about any of the data Yes, I think I'd agree with that. I, I think we've just got time now for one more question. Here's an interesting one, which is very pertinent to the times we're living in at the moment. What I would say is if I haven't managed, if we haven't managed to get to your question and answer it, I'm terribly sorry about that. What you can do is you can email it to, to me at careers at rsc.org and I will try to find somebody to answer it for you. Maybe with some of the questions, if you just listen to this broadcast again when it's up on YouTube, it might give you your answers but I just wanted to get this one question in because I do think it's important. Someone is saying that given the current COVID-19 situation, most of the presentations will be presented um, online. So are there any tips for those who are uncomfortable presenting online, especially when the video cam is on? Um, yeah, I can understand why that seems extra scary. So any, any hints and tips for that from anyone? I think try and forget about your your camera. Um, so quite often when you start sharing your screen and you start giving the presentation, um, you don't have to look at yourself anymore. So you can kind of hide your picture or your, your camera behind the presentation and, and that's quite a good way. So then you're just giving your presentation and you're not looking at yourself doing it. Um, I think all the things that apply to normal presentations in a room with people apply to online presentations, but even more so, you have to be even more prepared to come across well. You have to keep your slides simple and not have anything too busy or too much going on because really things can go wrong, bits of your slide can disappear off the bottom of the screen, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> all kinds of things can happen. So, so you need to be kind of really prepared, really have thought about what you're going to say about each slide make sure that you know what is on the slide is going to be visible on the screen and sometimes that even means not using the bottom quarter of your of your powerpoint slide for information because it will just get lost um and think about you know talking clearly so so again as i said earlier recording yourself giving the presentation although it's awful because you have to then watch yourself speaking Sometimes that really is the best way to kind of get an idea of how you're coming across and how you can improve. OK, that's great. Thank you. One last comment. Um, someone, This is a really good piece of advice, I think. Someone is saying, hi, this isn't really a question, but an addition. I found that to get 
to, that to get practice giving presentations and standing up in front of people, I signed up for as much teaching as I could during my PhD. <laughs> as I knew more than the students in theory, it calmed my nerves. <laughs> and standing about standing up and talking oh. in front of a large group, it definitely helped with confidence in later talks. So I think that's a really good piece of advice. Um, yeah, you, you know, the better, the more you do this, the better you're going to get at it. I think it's yeah. fair to say. So we must move on now. We're coming to the end of this broadcast and um, I just wanted to take you through those of you who are members of the Royal Society of Chemistry who are listening in there's a lot of other things um, that the RSC does which you're maybe not aware of and I'm going to run through a few of them now we have got lots of networks which are very friendly very welcoming obviously face-to-face um, -face meetings are out at the moment but there's a lot of online activity going on in our community so you know it's always good and it gives you more confidence the more people you know the more feedback you can get so do make the most of your membership and join the um, networks that uh, that are appropriate for you and there that that web link there will show you where they all are and for those of you who are postdocs and um, think about the RSE's early career network that's specifically for people at the beginning of their career you'll be able to network there with people who are in academia in industry doing all sorts of interesting jobs so I would they're a very active um, group so I would recommend that um, RSC conferences, some of our conferences have gone online, so do check our database there and see what you can get involved with. Another couple of things that will be worth mentioning as well, there is some funding available through the RSC for travel and research. Um, for, for those of you who are postdocs, you can find out more there. Obviously, travel is not on the cards at the moment, but these are all things that you need to be aware of because they might help you at some time in the future. And also our Chemists Community Fund is a little known resource which does help our community very much and they are particularly wanting to help people who've been adversely affected by the COVID-19 situation. So yeah, do, do go to their pages and check out what they do. They offer lots of different types of support and advice. So I would encourage you to, you know, again, make the most of your membership and see if the Chemist Community Fund can help you at the moment. Just to reiterate, here we are, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them what you've told them. These are the webinars that we've got in the Jolly O' Curie programme this year. So October is our next one. Got your first academic position, what next? And then our third one in December is on all about the awful subject of bullying, how to protect yourself and support your colleagues. You can sign up for any of those for free, all on our events database there. Just a quick word about the team that I belong to, the Career and Professional Development Services. We can provide support for members at all career stages and all ages. Um, for most categories of membership, apart from affiliate, we can we can offer one to one consultations, not in person at the moment, by phone, Skype, Zoom, whatever suits you. We have got guidance on career planning, applications, interviews, professional development support. We have a mentoring scheme, which is very worthwhile. Um, we can help you with networking opportunities. There's a lot on our web pages at the bottom. And if you want to get in touch with us then about anything in this broadcast or anything else, then do drop us an email, careers at rsc.org, and we'd be very pleased to hear from you. So that brings us to the end of our session today. I hope you've all enjoyed it. I've certainly very much enjoyed it and I hope our panelists have too. It just really remains for, for us to say thank you very much for listening in and to wish you all the very best of luck. Uh, whatever presentations you have to do, we hope they go very well. Um, so Petra, have you got any final words for our listeners? No, just to echo what you were saying. So good luck and um yeah, I hope all your presentations are absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Danila, any final thoughts? Yeah, be positive and uh, yeah, good luck. Yeah, I think that's the best advice. Be positive and practice. Yeah. OK, thank you all very much for listening. I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, don't forget, drop us an email, careers at rsc.org if there's anything else that we can help with. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck. We're going to say goodbye for now and hopefully we'll we'll rejoin with you the next Jolly O'Curie webinar that we do in October. So goodbye for now and thank you for listening. <laughs>